and very excited about this conversation around storytelling. Uh, I do believe we all have a unique story and I have always been so fascinated about people's stories. And yeah. I would love to hear from Dr. Joey today how we can tap into our unique stories to share uh, in, a, in an authentic way and also make a greater impact in the world. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Joey, for being here, for taking the time uh, to doing this with us. Um, I'm trying to get this streaming to Instagram as well, but I'm not sure if I am succeeding at it. So we'll just keep going. Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about like what is sparked your passion about storytelling? First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I love just being in your presence with your amazing energy. It's just absolutely radiant. And um, I'm also really, you know, inspired by the little glimpses I've seen of you and your story sharing journey. Um, I know that you, you've you experienced the impact that it can make sharing your story. So I'm really grateful for being here. Um, thank you for welcoming me into your space. Um, and as far as... Um, talking about how, what sparked my story sharing journey. I mean, where would you like me to start in? <laughs> where should we start? Should we start in my story or should we start in sort of the story work that I do? We have a couple entry points to this. I would love to hear a little bit more about your story so the audience can connect with you yeah. and where you come from as well. Perfect. So I would say that um, for me, my story as a young person, as a child, always felt hard to tell. I am um, biracial. I was born outside of the U.S. and moved. I'm multilingual. Um, my father is Hakka Chinese, which is an ethnicity that most people in the U.S. don't know about. Yeah. Many people in Asia don't even know about. So there was a lot of aspects to my story that felt hard to tell. I have a name that a lot of people don't know how to pronounce, you know, a lot of things. So if um, there's anyone out there that can relate to that, um, you know, sharing my story really, I think, is for you. Um, where people, I think, either feel like they don't have a story or maybe they feel like they have too many stories and it's really complicated. And I fell in probably that, that second box. Um, also, as a child, I went through some things that felt really difficult and challenging. I went th through some, um, some things that became trauma and triggers for me growing up. And through those experiences, I just learned to keep a lot of things to myself. And one other aspect I will say, um, I will share with you is that I was also neurodivergent without being diagnosed. So I had to navigate the world without a whole lot of tools and resources and understanding about why I was experiencing things the way I was experiencing them. So that's the context. Um, but as a child, I was a very early reader. I think I taught myself to read when I was three years old. And I fell in love with stories and particularly nonfiction stories. I really loved to, to learn from other people's lived experiences. I was really into documentary films and biographies. And the human experience became sort of my special interest, right? Because I felt like if I could connect with other people's stories and almost like study them, it would help me make sense a little bit more about my life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there was a retreat for me into the world of writing and stories because at that time, at a young age, without the tools and the frameworks, a lot of times, you know, I would feel like I was really misunderstood. People would say, you know, you have a tone. I'm be like, that's not what I'm intending. Like there was just communication breakdowns because of some of those things I mentioned in my context. And I didn't have a guide or a framework to really help me through that. Um, so writing became a place of solace and comfort for mm -hmm. me because that's where I could work out my own voice and my own experiences in a safe space, right? Um, alongside that, there was another phenomenon that was kind of occurring, which is that as I got into my teen years, um, I started living a really full life. I, I always have had big interests and I go for my interests. That's a little bit of how I'm, my brain is wired. So if I'm passionate about something, I go full force into it. And I created a lot of uh, really memorable experiences for myself. And what I would find is that when I would share these in the form of stories, 
it really helped me connect with people. And people mm -hmm. would come to me again and again, hey, tell that story again, right? Tell about the time that you fell off the roof and had a concussion, right? Um, tell about the time that you were kidnapped in Morocco. Tell about the time that you, um, you know, tamed the wild um, horse, the Mongolian horseman's horse in Mongolia when you're trekking across the, um, the Mongolian, uh, it's not called the outback, what is it called? The tundra, right? So I had all these like amazing stories that I found like, on the one hand, I was living a life that felt really novel and exciting for people. And in my storytelling, I was forming connections that felt really good for me. And I was seeing the enjoyment in them. And so I started to fall in love a little bit with that experience of sharing these stories. And these stories felt safe because they were sort of my, you know, like my hero stories, my adventure stories. It gave me sort of an outlet that I could connect with others without having to dig too deep into all that other stuff that felt hard to um, kind of go into. Um, as I was sharpening these story skills through my writing and my speaking, right, um, in these, these story sharing um, moments, I started to realize that it was actually a really resourceful tool for me. So I was able to win quite a few scholarships and get into quite a few programs in college through writing stories all without even touching on trauma or some of the hardships, which I would come to find later is how most people approach those opportunities as they kind of, you know, share their hardship stories. But just because I had built this muscle of story sharing in such a novel way, it was still able to open doors for me um, in that young adult life, um, which brings me all the way to starting my career as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, my career as a teacher started because I went on another adventure. I, I signed up to volunteer in Tanzania um, and work in children's homes there and teach in schools there, kind of without too much direction after college. And there, my students were saying, Miss Joey, you're meant to be a teacher. Promise us you'll never stop teaching. And I, I, I took their words. I put them in my heart. I felt the impact. And I thought, okay, they see me in a way that I hadn't seen myself before. Maybe this is my mission. This is my service. And I promised them I would never stop teaching. And I'm, I'm making true on that word to this day. Um, but I had to come back to the States after college and I had to face even more hardship. My family had experienced bankruptcy and foreclosure. We lost our house. Um, which broke apart my family unit. We were no longer in relationship with one another, in contact with one another. I went through quite a few hardships, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, I experienced housing insecurity at that time, and then I'm really careful to use the word homeless because I never actually had to sleep outside, but I went through a phase of having to couch surf and getting kicked out of homes and sleeping in my car for some time. Um, and it was storytelling that became a mode of survival for me. And there was a couple key instances. One, I, I, I had gotten asked to leave out of another house. I had overstayed my welcome. And I was working like under the table jobs, like three jobs, you know, cleaning people's houses, nannying, tutoring, anything I could find kind of under the table. So I didn't have pay stubs. I had virtually no money in my bank. I had debt. And it was, I was in a position where it was seemed impossible for me to be able to find my own place. And I went and connected with an apartment manager and in communication and sharing my story with her from an authentic place. She was able to see my values and my work ethic and my heart and believed in kind of the bigger goals I had for myself despite these obstacles. She took a chance on me and rented me an apartment when I had absolutely no qualifications. And that year I then applied for my master's program at UCLA and was able to get into the program, able to receive some grants and really connect with my purpose. That the why behind all of this was my desire to serve others, specifically young people in public schools, in under-resourced communities, um, and to try to be a beacon of hope, a mentor for other kids with similar backgrounds to mind and make sure that they didn't have to go through as many hardships as I had to without a guide or a mentor or resources. And so in connecting in that way, I was able to navigate through this more difficult time in my life. And once I was in the classroom, I started to face what happened? A lot of the struggles. If you're a teacher or in education, you you might know some of the struggles that happen in the classroom. But um, you know, from bullying to students just not having an outlet for many of the hardships they're going through at home, mm. it kind of naturally came back to storytelling. And no one really had taught me this, but I found that storytelling became a place of comfort 
and became a, a place of humanizing one another. And I was able through these story sharing experiences I began to design and embed into my learning frameworks um, to really build community in my, my classrooms and resolve situations of, of, like I said, bullying, conflict, misunderstanding, discrimination, racism, like all of these things start to mel melt away when we share our stories with one another. We start to see each other as, as really human, right? And no matter how different our lives are, we start to see those familiarities and those connection points and love one another. It becomes easy, much easier to love and respect one another when you know what they've been through and you see them for who they are, right? Um, and so that became really where I said, this is important work, right? This is more than just personal. This is a collective, um, there's a collective need here. And there was another sort of pivotal moment of a big ask. So I remember I had said the, the students in Tanzania said, they yeah. asked me, never stop being a teacher. Now, here we are a few years later. I've committed to that. I have my own classroom. I've gotten my credential. And I'm in this moment of sorting out like, okay, stories seem to be the solution. Before I can even teach them, you know, how to write an essay or how to analyze something, like we have to feel safe and we have to feel like a community. We have to want to be in this classroom with one another and learn together. And stories was the doorway for that. Um, and then another moment of ask came up where my students said, hey, this is meeting a need for us. A lot of them had also been through traumatizing situations. I was working in the same community I grew up in um, where people mostly working class, um, children of color, immigrant backgrounds, and um, susceptible to violence and other forms of trauma. Um, and a lot of them were starting to find that by writing and telling their story, there, there was healing in that. And so they asked me, can, can we make this into a club or a class? They wanted more of it. And that sort of aligned perfectly with the drama teacher at our school stepping down. He said, I'm done teaching theater. I, I don't want to bring... <laughs> <laughs> and the counselors came to me and they said, um, there's an opportunity for you here. We, we see the work that you're doing with students and it seems to be making an impact. Would you be willing to step in and, and take this class? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't teach theater. Like one thing about me, I don't act. <laughs> I keep it a hundred. I keep it super real. <laughs> and they said, that's okay. It just needs to fulfill the fine arts credit, the language arts credits, and, you know, fill this time slot. Um, but if you're not teaching theater, you'd have to write the course for it. Most teachers, I would come to find out, most teachers who undergo the course writing uh, process take like a whole year. And there's like mentorship programs and everything because we have to get these courses approved by the University of California and the California State University to count for college transferring credits. And I had two months. But, you know. I did what I do. I figured it out. Right. And so I studied other courses that had been approved and I, I saw the opening because I said, here's the opening for me to answer my students ask and fill this need in the community. Um, and to do this work that I was starting to find is, is really needed. This healing work, this empowering work, right. This, this work that builds community. Um, and so I did, I, I, I wrote the course and it was founded in oral traditions and histories. And then it, it, took stories and turned them into an art form in spoken word. We explored different modalities, poetry, spoken word, TED Talks, right? We kind of looked at different ways that we could tell our stories. And I could not have imagined what would come of that course. We wow. started to be invited to perform on different stages across the region. It literally felt like we were transforming lives. And in that, I had to, I don't know if you've experienced this, Angelica, but sometimes when you step into like coaching or teacher roles, you're sometimes only one step ahead of the folks that you're teaching, right? And it forces you, it pushes you to grow really fast just to hold that space for them. So in those few years that I was teaching this course, that's exactly what happened. I had to like do a deep dive into like getting all the trauma-informed frameworks. I, I really started to study um, decolonizing and indigenous frameworks and saying, how can I create methodologies to make sure I'm handling these sensitive but powerful stories in the, the, the most careful way and the most empowering way. So that's really where I got my foundation. I would go on to get my PhD and do a narrative dissertation working in indigenous um, communities all centered on story, publish that. And now I'm here, which is a whole nother story. I can, I, I feel like I'll pause here because that was a long story. I kind of took you through the whole gamut, but I'll pause right here. But yes, now I'm here sharing my frameworks um, with folks online and professionals and, and really still feeling empowered to do so. 
Wow. I mean, where do we even start? I think I started feeling goosebumps from the minute that you told me that the kids in Tanzania, yeah. you've got to promise me like all through yeah. my body, my head, like oh. the whole thing, like goosebumps up to now. I was like, oh my God, this is, there's so much energy in that. Mm. And, you know, I experienced myself in writing my own story you know that you know a lot of things would sometimes come out that I didn't even realize that I had been traumatized by it and at different stages you know every, at the beginning of my journey when I would write a post I would release some of the trauma another yeah. post some of the trauma then I went to write my book and I remember some stuff coming out thinking like oh my god I thought I had overcome this but it's still coming you know and I release a lot of other stuff out of that and and I think what you like I can connect to you in such a deeper level just by everything that you told me about mm. your story like my family also went through bankruptcy um you know fortunately we didn't go through you know like the, the house uh insecurity thing but in saying that it, it was a big trauma in my life yeah and you know when you hear that from somebody else you just realize you know even like what you're talking about in this setting that perhaps you're not getting on with that person but you hear that they are also have gone through something that you have gone through and you're like wow you know like I respect that person at a whole different level right mm. Mm. yeah and imagine that same exchange that you feel happening in spaces where um people have been conditioned to be at odds with one another right mm. like I was dealing with this in the classroom where it's like maybe I had kids of rival gangs nice. right or ethnicities that were conditioned to feel like oh we're not going to see eye to eye because that's how they were socialized and the minute that we start doing this story work I mean it takes let me let me just say this it takes setting up so much safety in that space in order for anybody to enter in. So it's not just like you can just come into a room, throw people into a room and tell them now go and be vulnerable <laughs> with one another and love each other afterwards. Yeah. You know, um, it, it can't, it doesn't, not to say that it's not, it, that it can't shift quickly, but there has to be some intentionality behind it. And so as I was discovering it, just like you were saying, you don't have to hear the whole story, hmm. but once you're primed to start to hear just the pieces that you didn't expect, that surprise you and that humanize that person for you, and then suddenly you realize you're receiving something from them. Hmm. Wait, this person that maybe like, you know, I didn't expect to get anything from, or in some of the extreme cases, like, you know, I was taught to hate or taught to look down on wow, suddenly they're giving me something that makes me feel less alone in my experience. Mm. That's making me feel inspired, right? Mm -hmm. It's truly one of the most powerful human experiences. And our, our ancestors knew this, right? That's why storytelling is as old as time. Yeah. yeah. When you didn't have TVs and you just sat around the fire and just told stories, right? Yeah. And when you were, you were talking about the, you know, the life that you lived, like this full life, you know, and people saying, tell me that story again. You know, I, I wish I could bring you here so you can tell my kids because my kids will be doing, tell me that story again. Tell me that story again. <laughs> because, you know, we, we get, it's a, you know, people, I think, learn from each other's story as well, right? There is so yeah. much learning. And in your own, in your own, like, right, sometimes you take bits out of it that other mm. people never thought about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what I learned from my journey, and I want to shift gears a little bit because I know that now you're helping online entrepreneurs, right, to mm -hmm. sharing their story. And I want to ask a few things that I had a lot of hesitation at the beginning. So people feel that, you know, they are not alone and, you know, perhaps you can give them some, you know, tips or tools to overcome that. I think the, the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, I was a stage three back cancer survivor. I had just finished treatment and I finished chemo feeling stronger than I started. But I wasn't a doctor. Mm -hmm. right? I wasn't, I didn't have the qualification. So that thought of who am I mm. to share this story? And, you know, is, are people really going to listen to me? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how, how, you know, how do you kind of go about uh, taking yeah. on this journey of, you know, yes, people are going to listen to you. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. That's such a good point. Thank you for um, your authenticity and sharing that. It's vulnerability because 
I mean, I think it's something that we all experience. I, I went after having a PhD <laughs> because yeah. I dealt with imposter syndrome so deeply in the classroom. You know, I was, I, mm. I, I just felt like to protect the work I'm doing, to validate anything I'm doing, I have to, you know, get this degree. And even with a degree, I still experience this. Like even in this new chapter, which is also catalyzed by an ask, right? Like I was freelancing and just offering these services and it fell into like really helping the people I was working with online. And they said, you have to like offer this to, to everybody, right? Make this a course, make this a business. And I'm like, me? Like, uh, you know, wait, let me go and get my life coaching certification really quick so I can validate and deal with that imposter syndrome. So it's so, so universal. And also, um, you know, sometimes I have to remind myself to be the student and, and listen to my own teaching because what I, I teach folks that I work with is when we honor our lived experiences, when we honor our stories as our greatest teacher, suddenly it doesn't become about us anymore. Mm. When I, I have a method that I do when I work with students and that's to create a, a story bank. I actually have a, a story bank system, but I teach you how to fill your story bank. Mm. And it's, it's such a ceremony. It's such a ritual where you take all the stories in your life with all the themes that they may embody, good or bad, or however we perceive them, and you start to lay them all out. And you really take the time to honor, wow, I've had this life with this much depth. And you know, you don't have to be like an adventurer like me to see this. Like, I, I hope that this doesn't become an obstacle for anybody that's hearing yeah. this. Um, or you don't have to have, you know, like Angelica survive cancer. Like, uh -huh. please don't think that when you hear someone else's story, because you haven't lived that experience, that you won't find the riches in your story. You will. Everybody will. I've never worked with one person out of the hundreds of people I've worked with who doesn't have something amazing, um, something that's impacted them, that's taught them. And when you start to see your stories, then you start to understand actually sharing my story isn't about me being good enough. It's actually an act of gratitude to the universe or whatever higher power you believe in for, for letting me have these experiences and living this life and learning from them. And it's an act of love and generosity to then share that with others so that they don't have to feel so alone or that they can get that insight. They can learn a little bit of my lesson and, and have that shape their path. Because you actually start to see when you look at your story bank, wow, this person or this story or this piece of art or this film shaped mine. And now I'm just part of the landscape and the context for so many other people that when I share my story, I get to be that little door, that little catalyzing moment for them. Yeah, that is so important. Like what you said, like, you know, I, I used to get people like, you know, DMing me or, you know, on calls going, Angelica, like, I can't believe what you have achieved, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and they were going through sometimes health issues that were a lot worse than I had ever gone through. Mm. But they didn't see it like that because, you know, my one has the word cancer in it. Mm -hmm. right? The cancer world is, you know, is if everybody feared this. There was so much fear and negativity around that word. And it's such a charged word mm. that people can't get over it. They think that's it, you know, like, and mm. like I said, they don't have to go through. I mean, sometimes, I mean, not sometimes, every time I would have somebody in front of me and I, I would be like, but do you see what you've been through? Like, mm -hmm. isn't that not like clear to you? Let me just tell you, you know, retell the yeah. story back to yes. you. Yes. Right. Exactly. I had a client once, she had overcome so much. Mm. And I'm like, D do you kind of, let, let me just go back to, let's just remind you what you've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. That's so powerful being able to be a mirror for others, right? Um, but we can also learn the tools how to create that for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And and like these tools have not really been taught. They're not being taught in schools. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our oral traditions and our oral histories have been lost along the way as we've moved into this very fast-paced modern society. And when you made that comment where you said you're working with folks and you're like, how do you not see this amazing story, this amazing life that you lived? You know, what? one thing that I teach is that there's a difference between our lived experience in the moment that it's happening, our memories where we can quickly recall 
the lived experience, but without a whole lot of processing, it's just sort of this memory matter that in our brain. And then the story, the story is on the other side of living the moment, recalling the memory, the story, you don't actually get to the story without spending time and, and processing and taking mm -hmm. intentional steps to whether that's journaling and putting on paper, or, you know, a lot of the story work is also done in, in therapy. If you have somebody who can be that mirror for you and mm -hmm. ask you those guiding questions, or then, you know, maybe deep diving, taking a course or something or getting coaching and learning these tools for yourself so that doing your story work can be something that you come back to again and again. But a lot of folks don't even know like, oh, just living the moments and recalling the memories isn't actually seeing the story or, or experiencing mm -hmm. the story for myself, you know, and that's why we miss so much. We're so fast in our life, living our life that we, we stop, we don't stop to see and understand what we're really experiencing. Yeah, I mean, 50% of our memories are not even true, right? Like that's mm. research based. So it's not like that what you were remembering, it was what actually happened, right? So it's, um, so now again, shifting a little bit of gears here, like people, so let's say, you know, I'm a, a new coach and, and I, I've got this amazing story and I know that, but I don't know how to put it on paper. Mm -hmm. I like, I think that a lot of people like English is my second language and I, I still make lots of mistakes, you know, like with, you know, my grandma, whatever it is, or the way that I would say things. Um, but, you know, I, I must admit that for me, it wasn't that hard, like to mm -hmm. do it that bit. And I know that a lot of people feel stuck on it. You know, like, they're mm -hmm. like, I don't know how to even start. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, how do, you know, which part of my story do I speak about? Yeah, that's a great question. First, I want to touch on um, you saying that your English is a second language. is mine too, but even though I acquired English very early, so it wasn't as much of a barrier. But most of my, my start in teaching was working with um, language learners, and I still work with language learners. And when I mentioned the course that I created, one of the most remarkable things was I would get new immigrants who, who didn't speak any English to my, my EL classes, my English learner classes one year, and then they would join my um, oral expressions, my, my public speaking class the next year, and they would be on stage sharing their story. So when I work now with entrepreneurs who have these like mental language barriers, I go, hey, if my war refugees, you know, that came to me at 15 years old, speaking not a word of English, um, could get on stage and share their stories impactfully, like just let's trust the process, you know, the, the message will carry you through. So I wanted to um, affirm that for you um, or for our audience as well. Um, but when you say what techniques can really like, can we go to to really start getting our story on paper? And you mentioned sometimes it just feels like I don't know where to start. Everything is just kind of a blur. The first thing I would say is um, your finished story is many, 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 many iterations from where you start. Yes. <laughs> so when you have this expectation, like maybe you've read someone's story, you've gone to their, um, you know, about me page on their website, and it just seems so polished and put together. Or you hear a, you know, a speech or something that comes through a lot of refinement and processing. And you have to give yourself permission to be messy, right? Before you have a complete story, you have to give yourself permission to just start sorting through the memory matter, the story matter. And so like a lot of the work that I do is just starting with prompts that trigger that free flow, right? And just trusting the process. I tell my students, you don't even have to write complete sentences. Mm -hmm. The most important thing in that first stage is to train your brain to drop its effective filters that mm -hmm. silenced your inner voice all this time. So let go of spelling, let go of grammar. If you're, you know, English is not your first language, write in your first language, mix languages if you need to. The first and most important thing is get what's in your heart and in your mind down on paper, right? Handwrite. I, I, I recommend handwriting yeah. if that's something that you that's physically comfortable for you because it removes the distraction from the screens. But if that's not, you know, now we have all these great tools of um, dictation, right? Speak, yeah. speak to text or typing, whatever works for you. But dropping those effective filters and just dumping, right? And then there's lots of steps that you can do go through afterwards. As I mentioned, I use a story bank system. Then we start to look for themes and we start to pull out stories from there. Um, but just understand, I would say for anyone who's just starting, understand that it's a process one, right? Give yourself permission to get messy. Give yourself permission. Sometimes you have to tell the same story to yourself a hundred times just to work through some, like you said, you would post and you'd feel that some of those triggers come up. 
I really recommend to most of my um, clients and students that we be our first audience, our first best audience, where we just create a cozy, safe space to get that out and work through those traumas and give ourselves love and gratitude and then trust the process. We can shape this story and uh, we can put more pieces together. We can start to find those other memories um, and make it something that we really love telling. And when you talk about that, like, you know, when I remember writing about things that were really vulnerable, like, you know, mm. I was addicted to anger, you know, I was addicted mm. to stress, you know, and um, a lot of people are blocked and they don't want to speak about their vulnerable self, right? They just want to put, you know, just pictures of their, you know, perfect self now or they don't know how to speak about their vulnerable self. Mostly I would say what, from what I have noticed, especially when you're in this online entrepreneurial world, is, you know, what would my auntie think? What would my cousin think? You know why? <laughs> right? Absolutely. It's not, it's not like what would my friend from high school think, right? Yeah. And because yeah. of that, like you said, they silence their voice. Yes. Yes. Yes, so absolutely. Another part of the framework is that you have to be a self-validating storyteller, mm -hmm. right? So if you are still in a mindset where you feel like your story is some a transaction to get approval or attention, or unfortunately, really in this entrepreneurial space, like we've taken the transaction so far as like story yeah. selling, where, you know, the value of my lived experience, my life is if I can convert to a sale at the end of the story. And I go, oh my gosh, like from a trauma-informed perspective, I'm like, yeah. No, we can make genuine connections with people. Our stories can actually impact people and change people's lives. And from that, they might choose to work with us, right? Like that's, that's you know, we have to trust that process that if we we are good at what we do in serving people, that they're going to come to us. But when we like condense it into this moment of like, is my story going to captivate them enough that they're going to take out their credit card? Oh my gosh. Then we create, we really reinforce what you just talked about where where we are so vulnerable and so susceptible that anytime the audience doesn't give us what we had hoped for mm -hmm. we reintegrate that into our nervous system that mm -hmm. we're not good enough that oh this is why i shouldn't have told my story i'm gonna i'm just gonna keep quiet next time that was a failure right that's how we repeat those patterns and so yeah step one is that we have to be a self-validating storyteller and you don't just turn that on. What you do is you really connect with your stories, like I mentioned again, from a place of gratitude where you see how powerful those lessons were that you lived. And when you can shift into that space of I'm sharing this story because it was truly transformational for me. And if one person, just one person out there gets hope, insight, right, connection, oh. and belonging from this, that's worth it to me. And then it just kind of opens the floodgates, honestly, right? The more that you do it and the more you exercise that storytelling, that self-validating and rooted in your purpose type of storytelling, it opens unbelievable doors for connection and cultivating community. Yeah, that's that's beautifully said. And and I think what you said, you no, know, it's true. Like we have taken a bit too far in the sense that, you know, in the online world, people are telling stories, you know, just to convert a client. Um, but, but I think what also it's important to highlight if you're starting as a coach is that, you know, tailoring your story for um, what it is helpful to people, right? Like, yeah. just, you know, like, you know, as an example, if I just went live and I just, you know, talk about, you know, just walking around and talking about whatever, you know, like, yeah. that's also not of value to people. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's people that will have time to, to listen to that, but I'm not sure that people who are, are open to making a change in their lives and transforming their lives will listen. Absolutely. So yeah. how do, again, you know, coaches think about that, you know, um, because I think it's also like the whole online world is an exchange, isn't it? Like you, if all you did, you put your, your best stories out there and you've never, never, ever converted a client, you will stop sharing your story. Mm. You know, like, mm. does that make sense? It's kind of an exchange. Yeah. You want to see that you are making an impact in someone's life. 
Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. When when you started sharing your story, like you obviously went through a process, right? To write your book, right? That's a process. <laughs> anyway, who's written something long form before knows, right? Um, but when you wrote that book and started putting it out there, what was your experience that others started to find you and connect with you and, and see the value in, in how you were able to serve them? So... I wrote my book after I had worked with people and I, I had like um, recorded uh, my course and I had done a lot of things already. So mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted out of my book. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take people on a self-reflective journey yes. to understand how they can create disease and disharmony and how they can empower themselves to create healing and health. Absolutely. Yes. It wasn't hard for me to write the book. Because I knew that I just wanted people to go from A to B. Yes. Whilst reading. So I had, so I would say, you know, if you ask that question, it will be more around at the beginning of my journey when I was writing just posts, you know, and mm. I was digging out like what, what actually was of value to people. Um, I would say that it became more important when I highlight more my wins then my, um, you know, I was struggling and I was exhausted, mm -hmm. I was tired. Because when you talk about that only, you attract a certain type of people that are uh, stuck on the um, on the victim mentality, which yeah. I had. Yeah. So, um, and there was nothing you could have told me to get out of that. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. right? There was nothing you could have told the old Angelica. I needed to go through cancer to get out of that. Mm. Wow. So, you, you know, you could be talking for that, you know, that person for hours on end. So once I started talking more about, you know, I finished 12 sessions of chemo feeling stronger than I started. I'm the happiest I've ever been. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done the inner work. So people got connect, you know, the, the, the people that I wanted to work with, the people that I wanted to take from A to B, there were the people that were like, you know, I, I want this too. Yes, I don't yes. want to stay stuck anymore. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but that was perfect. That was a perfect illustration of the point that I was hoping to make. And one of the things I would teach even when I was working in the classroom or when I'm working with clients is that you found that there was the most impact when you shared stories at a certain point in your journey, which was the point where you had kind of gone through the transformation to a certain degree. Like we're always in process, we're never totally finished, but there was sort of, you were kind of on this point of the arc, right? Not in this point, because when we're in that like climax point of like deep in the middle of the challenge that we're facing, what happens is when we go to share, we're not really sharing a story. We're making bids for connection from a place where we need something from the audience, mm -hmm. whether that's when we're in that victim mentality and we might not even understand that, but when we're in crisis or breakdown and we don't know where this is going, right? We haven't worked through, we haven't gathered the resources. We haven't gotten to this point of the arc yet. Any kind of um, communication or or sharing, oftentimes energetically what we're doing is we are asking instead of giving in our story. We are asking for validation. We're asking for guidance. We're asking for anything. And this is tricky as a coach because sometimes it's like we, we do, like we want to fight back. We gotta want to push back on that like perception that we're all put together and that we're only sharing our wins and that we're, you know, because that doesn't feel authentic. But I would say um, if you're a teacher or a coach, the one question that I can offer you that I ask myself is, and I had to ask myself working in those very sensitive contexts, working with minors and, and you know, is what, and I actually, I wrote a, wrote an article that touches on this a little bit called finding authenticity. Um, but create a framework with yourself where you give yourself permission to be a person in process. We're all still healing. We're all still on multiple of these arcs these we're all facing different challenges and learning different things at the same time but the one question you can ask yourself is when i go to share this and i go to communicate this is my message in a place of where i can give or is my message in a place where i'm really expecting something from the audience where i'm asking them to validate me or i'm asking them to solve this problem for me and the authenticity can come in where you are honest about the challenges you faced right 
but you've processed the challenge. Now you're here, just like you shared. You're on the side where you can say, I'm sharing this with you because I'd like to take your hand and bring you on the journey with me. And that starts to feel like a, a safer entry point for you know our students and our clients to say, yes, I, I would like to take your hand. I would like you to walk me through that because they, they see that you're at a point where you can help them. Does that does that kind of answer the question or help? Yeah, and I think that is that is very powerful for people who are starting out because mm -hmm. um, you know the focus for me at the beginning was on somebody that I could never help, which was the old version of myself. Mm. But I could help the person that had gone through um mm something already a little scare or wake up call or whatever it was to to transform their lives right mm -hmm. because at the beginning what I wanted to help was uh, you know people not to to get to where I had been you know mm. which it, which is power in itself but the reality is we live in a world that you know 70 percent of people have a chronic disease um and you know most people are living in exhaustion and they are accepting mediocre health and 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 people are just this is it you know like people said oh, but i have to be stressed i have to be exhausted I have to, but but they are not sick yet right i, like, I get not you sick yet right mm. they are they're on a path mm. <laughs> whether mm -hmm. they like it or not the path is it's moving towards the wrong direction mm. but and, you know, and sometimes you can still get the diagnosis and you still not wake up to the, you know, to, to, to life and going, I need to change myself. Mm -hmm. which I have spoken to many people in that position as well. So, so I think Absolutely. what's, you know, when people are sharing their stories, like I said, if they're new, it's just thinking like, you know, at what point, like at what point in my story that I can connect to somebody who actually wants to be helped and transform yeah. their lives, right? Yeah, no, that's that's a great, great point. Yeah. Um, but th I think that's the beauty of um, sharing stories as gifts and expecting nothing from the audience is because when you put it out in that way, it's going to be the person who's actually something's already kind of turned on in their brain and they're going, maybe they didn't know what they were looking for. But once they hear it, they go, oh, there's something here. I was I was looking for change. Sometimes that's all that, you know, the place that they're in in their head is. I don't want to be here where I'm at right now in my life anymore. And I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what's going to help me, but I don't want to stay here. And then they hear your story and it kind of just pushes them to take that next step. But that's, that's such a great point that you made because we have to, we have to be okay with the fact that there's going to be many others that may come in contact with us or with our stories and they're totally okay right now in their life and maybe for the rest of this lifetime being just where they're at and it's not our job or responsibility to convince them of anything it's just right we just live our path our our purpose and and trust that those who are meant for us will connect with us when when we share in that way that's beautiful so so what you're saying as well is just the energy behind right they, when you're writing a story like is the energy mm. behind you know is it am i writing this to be of value to people mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. am i writing this to get something back from people right mm. yes and and what i teach is that there's we need something back often but there's spaces for that, right? Whether that's in therapy or with your coach or very intimate support groups, or hopefully as you go through this, um, you know, some of these healing and self-development um, processes, you learn to cultivate those uh, relationships in your intimate circle, right? A good friend or a partner mm -hmm. where you cultivate that very reciprocal communication where, hey, I'm kind of, I'm needing this right now. And it's okay to ask for that, right? But that you can then separate that mode of story sharing and communication from when now I'm stepping into my role as a teacher, mm -hmm. as a coach, as a mentor, and I'm stepping into my power and I'm stepping into my responsibility and I can show up in these spaces, right? Imagine if I was a high school teacher and it was like every day I was having a bad day and I made it all my students' problem yeah. to you know, make me laugh, cheer me up, right? That sounds so silly. Like yeah. that's ridiculous. And so 
it's the same, it's the same energy, right? So when we step into spaces where we want to be of service yeah. to others, we have to ch just, just an internal calibration. Yeah. Have I gotten everything I need first? So that now I can go and be generous and I can share what others need from me, right? That's beautiful. Step in your power. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, as as the role of a teacher, and and um, you know the the person who can guide them. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's powerful. So now tell us how can people reach out to you and like the work that you do with people. You kind of mentioned a little bit about your program as well, but just tell us a little bit more about you know, who would be, you know, the best person that would benefit from, mm. from your program. Thank you, Angelica, for that. Um, so I've been working one-on-one -on -one with students um, and clients and, and entrepreneurs um, just this past year. And I'm, it's really exciting. I've been working really hard the last few months to create a group program to kind of meet sort of some of this um, growing demand. And so I'm um, planning on um, inviting people into a group coaching experience and to kind of take them through this whole journey that I've touched on a little bit here and there through this talk. Um, so that's, um, I'm pr I think opening pre-sale <laughs> this weekend for the course. So you can go to my website, um, drjoeyliu.com. Um, and I've tried to get really like dig into my curriculum design expertise to really figure out how I can scaffold this and create multiple entryways for folks. Um, because I really want to be of service specifically to anyone who is mission driven and has a heart of service for others because i really you know coming out of um public school institutions for so long where i really that was where my mission was but we're kind of in this moment in in the zeitgeist of society right now after the pandemic yeah. and kind of seeing where everything's going on where i think that um community grown organizations, businesses, small businesses, spaces where we can really be creative and authentic are more important than ever, right? Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of systems just continue to not evolve fast enough, you know, and not meet the needs of the people in them, whether that's in education mm -hmm. or in business or community infrastructure. So I really, I'm hoping that my service just provides sort of a a starting place for yeah. anyone. If you feel, I've talked to lots of folks actually who go, oh, I've had an idea to do this, right? And just, you know, offer something, whether it's to women or in their community. Like I, I've been sitting on this. I really feel like I could help people with this, but the the block has been like, I don't know how to put myself out there, right? Yeah. I don't know how to talk about myself. I don't know how to promote myself, right? And if you have felt any of those things or if those things have come up for you as, as sort of barriers to you taking that next step i would invite you to come come onto my page i have some a free workbook there as well um and maybe see if this like group coaching or one-on-one -on -one or self-paced course any of those tiers could be something that could jump start um you taking that next step and being being stepping into your power right living that authentic life that people are craving to live yeah. and also just being so impactful and of so much service to those around you I think what you said is so important. We are at a, at a time in the world that, you know, people want to learn from real people. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 at the beginning, I didn't have the confidence enough to say, you know, out loud, what I have achieved, very few people have, but now I do. Mm -hmm. And an oncologist or a doctor can't talk to that because they haven't gone through what I have gone through. That part, yes. And and now that I've pivoted my business and I'm helping people to launch their online business so they can share their victory story, their hero's journey with somebody else is the same thing. I know that, like I said, a person has a unique story. Yeah. Somebody out there, they want to hear from them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not from, you know, and, and look, there is a place for the oncologist. They really helped me. But yes. what I did, you know, like it, it's a different thing. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. It's a different thing. Like it's not, it's different. Uh, oh my gosh, you make such a good point. It's it's almost like, you know, I, I delivered both of my children at home with the home birth. Yeah. And it's like, you can study, you know, everything about giving childbirth. But in that moment, I wanted somebody. My husband, he was so diligent to go through all the classes, you know, learn everything in the moment when I was in pain, pushing that baby out. I wanted a woman who knew exactly where my pain points were. 
in my back to have her hands on me. Yeah. <laughs> so it's absolutely true. And you made another point I want to highlight again. Um, you said that someone out there is waiting for your story. And mm -hmm. this was something when I was a classroom teacher, you know, I had many students. I, I was, I'm so grateful. I was very beloved by my community and my students, but I also was very aware. I'm not going to reach every single one. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one for every single kid. And that's okay. This isn't a popularity contest, yeah. right? When you step into your purpose and your power, your ego doesn't matter anymore. It's not about who likes me and who doesn't like me. You start to understand every single person is needed. And yeah. I might not be that teacher for that one, but somebody else is. Yes. And when you become a storyteller, whether that's a storyteller as a holistic coach or as a finance coach or as a, you know, a women's empowerment coach or a parent coach, whatever that one thing that you can offer is, what happens is the things that you're not an expert at, just by virtue of being a storyteller, you get to start making connections, right? Mm -hmm. I can, just like what you're doing, Angelica, you as a storyteller, you, you are inviting people on here to share their yeah. stories. And we get to like combine and amalgamate all of our expertise and our wisdom. And that's what community is. And that's what's so dope about this. We're not in competition with one yeah. another. We really start to see the collective power of community through our stories. And it is transformational. It's so awesome. That's amazing. Like um, I'm going to add all your details and hopefully people will reach out to you because I think that, you know, a lot of people are stuck uh, in sharing their story and making an impact in the, in the world um, because they have silenced their, vo their voice or they don't know how to do it. And the how to do it is also really important. Mm -hmm. right? Like and that's where you can take them. Mm. How do you actually take this thing inside you mm. out to the world? It's it's a very important part of creating an online business, a coaching mm. business. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, even with the know-how, like I'll say, I still receive immense benefit from other folks who hold space for writing and for creativity and for storytelling. Even if I have all the techniques up my sleeve, I don't have all of them, right? I'm always um, learning. But even if I have some of them that have served me and served others, there's some, I mean, I think you know this in the coaching space, there's just something powerful for being able to step into the place of a learner, drop mm -hmm. everything else and let somebody else kind of just hold that space for us and guide us and coach us. And it's, you know, really dope when we get to do it in a collective um, environment as well and feed off the energy of others and so that's that's what this is right powerful powerful yeah. well thank you so much dr joey it's been incredible thank you so much for your teachings i'm sure uh, people are going to get so much out of this um i'll okay. add your details below and yeah thank you so much for your time Thank you so much for your time, Angelica, your beautiful energy and your story sharing. And I really appreciate um, you sharing um, the space with me to speak to your audience. And uh, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you so much, Angelica.